Naraj, any, any thoughts on, on how you look at this data now and start to think about applying this into the clinical setting? Yes, so I obviously start with the IMDC risk categorization first. Patient has, uh, does fish, patient belong to a favorable risk category or uh, intermediate or poor risk category. So that's the first decision I have to make after talking to the, to, uh, after uh, evaluating the patient. Once we have decided, that yes, based on labs, based on history, patient belongs to intermediate or poor risk category. Then, the, then I look for the regimen, which is like, likely to be most curative, uh, with the, which I will have the most curative potential in this, in this given patient. I use interleukin-2, high-dose interleukin-2 for a long time, until 2015, for the, poten for the possibility or potential of that 10% chance of you know, long-term remissions. So if I look at the regimens in first line, uh, I look at complete responses first. Axi, Pembro versus Sunitinib. I think that if you look at the complete responses with the recent update, 9% versus 3%, so twice as much complete responses. If I look at EP Nevo versus Sunitinib, high inter, uh, intermediate poor risk patient population, 10 times increase in the complete responses. 1% with Sunitinib, 10% with EP Nevo. So that's that's the uh, you know big factor in my mind uh, as far as decision making is concerned, and then I look at the durability of complete responses, and if you look at the durability of complete responses, I think I think it's hard to beat the EP Nevo combination at this point of time. Look, 42 you know months uh, follow up presented in uh, just like few weeks ago in ASCO 2020. And we are seeing like one third patients are still maintaining the responses overall. And if their complete responses are more likely to actually retain, most of the complete responders are still in response. So I think those are the factors I take into account in for poor and intermediate risk patients. Favorable risk patients, I would admit is more challenging because there are favorable risk and there are favorable risk. You know, there's a patient with uh, one lung nodule, which is growing for last five years. We have been monitoring, not changing at all. I think I'll just not do anything. Just go for active surveillance in this patient because this patient may be harmed by what I offer to him in terms of medications. But then there are some patients, again, favorable risk category, five different sites of metastasis, but labs are completely normal and disease burden is quite high. In these patients, I would think about starting systemic therapy. So again, depending upon what the disease volume is, uh, I base I I I base my like uh, choice based on the disease volume in favorable risk category. So very low disease volume, active surveillance, uh, maybe just one or two sites of metastasis, slow growing, otherwise patient doing well, single agent wedge of, wedge of TKI. I pick up you know one of the wedge of TKI. Wedge of TKI can include pazapanib, sunitinib, but then look at the cabosan trial. Cabosantinib was superior to sunitinib. So I don't hesitate picking up cabosantinib as a wedge of TKI choice for these patients. And patients who have more rapidly progressing disease, still in favorable risk category, I tend to pick up axifembro, for example, in these patients. So, you know, just thinking about how I practice in my clinic, uh, this is, this is what I have to say. Interesting. Interesting. And I, I, that's a really good summary, Naraj. And, and I think, you know, what I, I like about that, I mean, you know, it's thoughtful. You, you, you use the whole armamentarium, right? I mean, there's a, there's a place for each one of these approaches in, um, in these frontline patients. And, and it's not one size fits all. And, and I think a big part of that is the, the, the risk stratification that you mentioned. 